Moves into it. Yeah, listening to a view from the hill. There it goes. It's high enough. It's long enough. The Rugby League Supporters Program. The beauty is straight between the posts. The score here now. Hello and welcome to That's the Way It Was, a program that looks back at the history of rugby league. In episode 7, Eastern Suburbs failed to win a match in the 1966 Premiership season. It was only the fourth time in the history of the New South Wales Rugby League that a team had failed to win a match in a Premiership year. Most experts were predicting similar dire straits for East the following season. But in 1967, a man would arrive who would change the fortunes of the Roosters and go on to become a legend of the game. To look at East season in 1967, we're going to speak to Perry Johnson, former panel member of Radio 2SER's A View from the Hill, secretary of the Alexandria Rovers Junior Rugby League Football Club and a lifelong Eastern Suburbs supporter. So, Perry, welcome to That's the Way It Was. Thanks, Rob, and thanks for having me. No problems. Now, Perry, uh, before we look at uh, 1967, I think we need to look at uh, what happened in the lead-up to that uh, season. Now, in 1960, Eastern Suburbs uh, made the grand final uh, where they were beaten by St George, but uh, the club seems to have uh, gone into a very steep decline after that in the uh, early to mid-60s. What was going on at East in the lead-up to that 1967 season? So, basically, in 1960, they made the grand final, which Mm -hmm. was captained by Jack Gibson, the Roosters team. Okay. They they had a a sprinkling of very old hard heads mm-hmm. who handled that style of rugby league, the unlimited tackle, the bash and barge. Mm-hmm. And then over the previous the few years after that, those men started to retire, and the players that came in weren't up to it. They what? wouldn't have been first grade standard and. You know, you look at the 66, 65, 64 seasons. Yes. Two wooden spoons and a second last. I think they won six or seven games in that period. And it was a poor period, mainly down to the standard of the players that had played for them. Well, what about, what was the state of the uh, Eastern Sub Junior League at this stage, mate? Uh, What was happening down at the uh, junior level? They were very strong in President's Cup. Mm -hmm. As if you go through the history of rugby league, in that period, it was South Sydney and the Roosters who dominated the President's Cup competition. Now, uh, the President's Cup at that stage, that was uh, an under-18s or under-20s uh, level? Under-21s. Uh, under-21s. It, uh, it was under-21s, which they then went up to the... They progressed to the 23s or the 30s, yes, as they yeah, called it, yeah. and so on. But the demographics of the eastern suburbs started to change. Mm-hmm. Um, the younger boys coming through the junior areas, stopped playing rugby league. They started rugby union, playing rugby union at the private schools. Mm -hmm. And I think you can trace that back now to the Roosters having no juniors, very limited juniors, as the people who grew up in the eastern suburbs when the traditional league areas, Woolloomooloo, Paddington, Mm -hmm. um, those people moved up to the central coast and out west and were replaced by the more yuppie, gentrified people who didn't have kids and weren't involved in rugby league clubs. All right, okay, now in October, uh, this is October 1966, uh, the club calls for uh, nominations uh, for the coaching position, not just the first grade uh, position, by the way, uh, uh, but the reserve grade coach and the third grade coach, and there are a number of nominees for the first grade position. Let me just go through these nominees. Bert Holcroft, who had been coaching the side for the uh, the previous two seasons. There's a fellow there called Doug Doney. Um, Ferris Ashton, who was a former Eastern Suburbs player. Jack Gibson, who was also a former Eastern Suburbs player. And uh, Clive Churchill, who has been coaching at uh, Canterbury. And in December, Jack Gibson is appointed first grade coach. Jack uh, Hampstead retains his position as the coach of the reserve grade, and uh, Colin Donahue, Donahue becomes a third grade coach. Of course, most people will remember now Clive Churchill. Uh, he went on to coach South Sydney, and Ferris Ashton actually ended up with a job at Sydney University in the uh, uh, the second division competition. So, firstly, Perry, 
Jack Gibson is appointed uh, coach. Uh, has he got any coaching credentials? He he applied for the position in '66 mm-hmm. and got knocked back due to his uh, lack of coaching at a decent level. Right in '66, as you know, they didn't win a game. No. So in '67, they were looking for fresh ideas. Uh, Ferris Ashton, famous favourite son, mm-hmm. um, the retaining coach who didn't win a game was no chance. Yep. Jack Gibson was looked upon as a man who had the Roosters DNA, or they were tricolours in those days. But Jack Gibson had the backing of quite a few eastern suburbs, local identities that um, pushed his cause. Right, OK, because it says... I, I remember reading in the... Uh, I think it was the Rugby League News, they said that... Uh, they said Jack Gibson Hotelier has been appointed uh, uh, the coach of eastern suburbs. Uh, he- Yes, that's correct. Jack rang a pub up at Charing Cross, the old Charing Cross Hotel, which is went under the name of the Robin Hood and various other names. Okay. But a lot of the who's who of rugby league identities of the eastern suburbs, Alan Clarkson used to drink there, then renowned punter, Perskely, bookmaker, the Waterhouse clan. So Jack rubbed shoulders with not only the local workers in the area, but some of the heavy hitters of sport within Sydney and I guess it didn't hurt when it came with his name getting pushed forward with his application. Right, so they had these, uh, uh, there were fairly sort of big Eastern Suburbs supporters. Uh, He had their support and they... I remember that uh, Charing Cross Hotel. There was a, there was a junior. Was there a junior rugby league club uh, affiliated with that uh, hotel? Yes, they used to run um, an A grade team. Yes, they didn't, they didn't have any other teams, and um, they yeah. were um, what you would say. They had some very big betting going on in their A grade games over the years. They had some supporters right. who would bet on scrums, okay. penalty counts, the like. It was a no. Yeah, it was a it was an A grade team, A grade club, who threw the money around a little bit. Okay, okay. I'm sure that uh, anyone that played in the Eastern Suburbs Juniors uh, around that period would remember that uh, team from the Charing Charing Cross uh, Hotel. Now, uh, Jack Gibson. Now, there's stories about him. He was travelling to the United States a lot to to study coaching and training methods. Yes, he, he spent a lot of time with the legendary Vince Lombardi. Uh-huh. Um, so the, the listeners, they may know that the, the Super Bowl trophy in America is the Vince Lombardi trophy. Yes. So okay. Jack, um, as I'm sure we'll touch on a little bit later, the rules of rugby league changed for the 67 season. Mm-hmm. And Jack looked at what he had on paper and realised they weren't the biggest team, but so they're going to build a team on defence. And Jack was always of the opinion that if you could keep the opposition to 10 points or less per game, you're going to be in a chance to win every game. All right. So Jack studied a lot of the defensive moves, the defensive training techniques that um, the gridiron players used, and he brought them back and I guess he revolutionised um, rugby league these coaching techniques. Yeah, uh, it was a bit revolutionary at the time because he sort of was had video analysis and this sort of thing and match, match statistics and all of that sort of thing. This was sort of like, well, it was a bit unheard of, uh, really, in rugby league at the time. Yeah, one of the things Jack did was he stopped the Roosters going on road runs. Uh-huh, OK. And his, thing, his big thing was you play rugby league on grass, you train on grass. Yep, okay, okay. So that was one of the techniques. And he also, um, he studied a lot of Swedish movement. At the time, you know, the Swedish long-distance runners were the, were the prelude to the great African Kenyan runners. Okay, yeah, so yeah. So he studied a lot of the Swedish techniques about stop-start endurance training. And again, he was ahead of his time. All right. And it was, it was from there where he had his little mate, Alfie Richards, right. doing the training. And they were... I guess you could say they were the original Batman and Robin of the rugby league circle. And I can also remember 
uh, the Nautilus uh, machines. The Nautilus, I think that came a bit later on, but uh, uh, when the Nautilus weight training machines came into Australia, I think uh, he was one of the ones that sort of like uh, uh, hopped onto that, was one of the first to hop onto that. Okay, let's just uh, move on here. So, uh, so Jack Gibson is a new coach, uh, but on the player front, well, uh, there's there's not much going on. East signed a player called uh, Jeff Chambers from Wagga Wagga. They signed Trevor Grady from Oberon. Uh, there is talk that a former player, Don Fenton, uh, may return from England. There's even talk that Ken Thornett, uh, who is in a dispute with Parramatta, may sign with East, but that doesn't eventuate. In the end, probably the most... Uh, significant player to join the club is a fellow from Leeds called Lewis Newman. Now, Perry, who is who is Lewis Newman? Tell us a bit about this Lewis Newman fellow. Well, Lewis was a South African. And right. he switched from rugby union in South Africa and went to Leeds in 61. Uh-huh. And in, and in 67, he came out to Australia. So he was, I guess, a, a, big, a big signing. Yep. But the Roosters... Went across. It went about signing some first graders who were ready to contribute straight away. Now, for players they had in the '67 season, but who did weren't there in '66. Yep. But made an immediate impact. I guess the ones that stand out the most was Alan McLean, the goal kicker. Yep. He came across from St George. Yeah. Finished leading point scorer for the team that year. Right. John Chow Hayes. Uh-huh. Came across from Western Suburbs. Only had the one year at the Roosters, but it was in 67. They signed another Englishman, um, Sid Walsh. Sid. His brother his brother played for England in the front row. Right. Sid was, a, I guess, the old style, straight up and down, hard, pommy front rower. Uh-huh. Who, his contribution straight away uh, made the team a lot more uh, strong in the middle. Yep. And then out in the backs, they picked up a, a young man from La Perouse, Brucey Larpa Stewart, an oh. Aboriginal man who... Okay. Um, you could guess the best way to describe him was he was a, a, a version of Chicka Ferguson before Chicka Ferguson came along. Okay. Small on, <laughs> small on structure, yeah, of very slight, but very slippery with the ball. He finished leading try scorer for the Roosters that year with 10 tries. Um, so they were the new yeah. men who came in, uh, who I guess hit the ground running and gave Jack a little bit to work with All and right. complemented some of the, the younger players who were already there and starting to establish themselves. And that's players such as Bunny Riley, Kevin Juni, okay, and then um, yeah, yeah. Ron Sadler, who yeah, yeah. was um, quite a player himself in those All days. Right. Okay, now off the field, there's a few things uh, happening as well. Um, a fellow called George Doldry from the City Tattersalls Club is appointed yes. the trainer at East. Uh, uh, apparently, George is a good friend of uh, Jack Gibson. Uh, is this uh, is this correct by you there? Yes, George Doldry was probably the first um, personal trainer. So anyone who trained okay. at the City Tats and they went to the gym, George was like the gym instructor there. George, over the years trained the Australian Rugby Union, the Rugby League team, various state teams, Olympians. Rugby. Oh, right. And George, I guess, being at the City Tats, probably knocked around with the Perth Caliers and the Waterhouses. Uh-huh. And then it was just a natural progression that um, he moved over with, with Jack. And again, the training, he got those boys super fit. And in January 1967, construction starts on the new Eastern Suburbs Leagues Club in Spring Street, uh, Bondi Junction. Yes, you could you could trace back Jack Gibson with the, the resurgence of the modern day Roosters back to this year. Uh, Ron Jones was a very astute businessman uh-huh. and he was able to negotiate uh, a loan for a million dollars interest free. Right. Which, yeah, okay. doesn't happen. Uh, it was for a local brewery company, Miller's, uh-huh. In return, Miller's had the exclusive um, sale of alcohol in the, the Lease Club. But 66, the late late 66 for the appointment of Jack Gibson, 
is when the, the changes occurred off the field, which allowed yeah. him to start redoing okay. on the field. Okay, okay. And also there, you mentioned earlier on, of course, uh, up until 1967, Eastern Suburbs have been known as the Tricolours. That was their nickname. But uh, in 67, they become uh, the Eastern Suburbs Roosters. Yes, the, um, they decided to try to um, use the Rooster um, as the French rugby league team had. Yep. They were named to play with a bit of flair. And, okay. Um, yeah, a bit of um, off-the-cuff play. But um, Alan Clarkson once said, anyone who grew up in the eastern suburbs knows the first thing you hear in the morning are those roosters bloody crowing. Okay. So the sun, the sun <laughs> rises in the east and the rooster crowed in the morning. Okay. Okay. So the pre-season competition starts, uh, the Wills Cup. Uh, and East uh, have a few victories in the Wills Cup. Uh, they beat Parramatta 12-5. to five. Uh, They also defeat Balmain. Uh, by 18-9, to 9. and remember Balmain were the grand finalist uh, from 1966, and Balmain would go on to uh, uh, win the Wills Cup uh, that year. They beat, uh, defeated Manly by 11-10 to 10 in the final in front of 24,219 people at Redfern Oval. But the 1967 Wills Cup is important for another a reason. 1967... As we've already mentioned, it's a bit of a revolutionary year for rugby league because the Wills Cup uh, that year, uh, in the Wills Cup that year, the new four tackle rule is being trialed. Trialed. Now the four tackle five yard rule has been introduced in England. They're playing under this rule in England. Um, uh, as you mentioned earlier, their rugby league has operated on an uh, unlimited tackle three yard rule for a very long time. But in 1967, the New New South Wales Rugby League trials the new four-tackle, five-yard rule in the Wills Cup. And at the end of the pre-season, the New South Wales Rugby League votes to adopt the rule changes permanently. It's not unanimous. Uh, Some clubs uh, voted against the change. I note there that Canterbury were against bringing in the new rule. Newtown also voted against it. Um, it was quite strange because it's St George. Uh, each club, I should mention, each club had two delegates. So each club had two votes. But at St George, Frank Facer voted for the new four-tackle rule. But the other St George delegate, uh, Len Kelly, voted against it. So, But in the end, the final vote of 40 to 9. And the 1967 season will be played under the four-tackle five-yard rule and this will become significant i know perry that we're going to talk you wanted to talk about this a bit later on okay now the 1967 premiership gets underway and in round one east are playing cronulla sutherland okay this is another part of the revolution that's taking place in 67 because we have two new teams in the competition cronulla and penrith have been admitted to the competition and in round one Cronulla defeat East by 11 points to 5. And there's quite a strong reaction to this uh, because Jack Gibson and the selectors drop a number of uh, players, including the fullback and captain, Ken McMullen. Now, he's replaced at fullback by Alan McKean. And 5'8", Jim Matthews is appointed captain and he remains captain for the rest of of the season. So, Perry, what can you tell us about uh, Jim Matthews? Well, Jim Matthews was uh, a footballer who most people rated as a toiler, mm-hmm. just a little bit off representative football, but a very good club football player. He was one of those players who just every time he looked like he was getting a foot in, in a, into a rep team, something happened. It was an injury or All right. um, a young player come through. But the thing about Jim Matthews, when he was appointed captain, uh, a lot of people presumed there would be little snem in the takeover. Uh-huh. And Jack went with the local boy who led from the front and was well respected by his peers. All right, all right, okay, all right. All right, now in round two, East uh, beaten by Canterbury, 16 points to 10. But in round three, there is a bit of a milestone. 
Uh, second row, Kevin Ashley uh, kicks a late field goal, and they secure a nine-all draw with Newtown at Henson Park. And this is Eastern Suburbs' first competition points in 26 matches. Now, they go one better in round six when they defeat North Sydney by 17 to 11. So this is their first premiership victory in a long time. In fact, they win all three grades in round six against Norse. And to help the celebrations along, the teams for the annual City v Country representative fixtures are announced. Uh, now, this is a, it's a big season of representative football in 1967 because New Zealand are touring Australia and there are, uh, the tour includes three test matches. So after round one, the City teams are announced. Kevin Juni is named halfback for the City Seconds. Now, Juni is already, he's already played some representative football. He played for New South Wales in 1966 and he's promoted to the City First team when Billy Smith pulls out with injury. But also in the City Seconds, Ron Sadler is named in the centres. Now, Perry, you've already mentioned Ron, but he has a very big year in 1967. What can you, what can you tell us about Ron Sadler? Well, I guess for our younger viewers who don't, listeners who don't know about the City Country game, yeah, it was a junior line representative game. Oh, yes. City first, country first, country second with boys, men from the bush. Yep. And, you know, you could make New South Wales from the city seconds or country seconds. Yes. Because Ron Sadler did that that year. Yes, he, he did. He played for New South Wales, I think, in game three, the interstate game three from Yes, him. yes. And, yeah, he was a quality He was a quality player. He was renowned for his covering defence. Yeah, there's um, many stories of him at the old city sports ground, chopping down opposition centres and wingers on the burst, mm-hmm. coming from the other end of the field with his tech book tackling. And he was, only, he was only a small man, but his defensive technique was superb, and he was picked in those rep teams because of his defence. All right. All right, now I want to go to round seven because uh, Eastern Suburbs, again, they win all three grades against Penrith. They beat Penrith uh, by 26 to 10 in the first grade. But after the match, there was a a, a very interesting article there written by Alan Clarkson in the Sydney Morning Herald. Clarkson says, and I quote, Eastern Suburbs rugby league team's rise from oblivion has been one of the success stories of the season. And... The final chapter has yet to be written. And he goes on to say, uh, Perry, that he believes that the new rule, the new four-tackle rule, suits the Eastern Suburbs team. Now, what 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 do you think he's talking What was he talking about here? Well, if you think back to the, the previous seasons, you know, the teams that were successful, which was St George, mm-hmm. Western Suburbs, and then South came along, they had dominating forward packs who would physically build you out the game mm-hmm. and then their backs would run wild. Mm. Now the Roosters under Jack Gibson went with the more, the less bulkier forward but went with like a mobile forward. And then he knew that if he stood his team back five metres in attack and now back five metres in defence, his players had 10 metres to work with with the ball. Mm-hmm. And so he, used, he went down that line and also the other thing he went with was the overall fitness of his plays and the defensive, the speed of the defensive line. And if you look at the Roosters that year, they finished with the best defensive record. Yes, I was going to men- mention this a bit later on, yes. Yeah, yeah. and that yeah. was all down to the fitness regime that yeah. Jack Gibson brought in with the help of Alfie Richards and George, you mentioned earlier. Yeah. But the game changed and the Roosters adapted to it a little bit quicker than... The teams that were successful the previous years still played that style because that was their strength. Mm -hmm. The Roosters only had one way to go, which was up. And as you know, you know, you get your first win out the way after that long drought. Mm -hmm. Two and three start to happen. Yep. And then next thing you know, you're you're not the easy boots, you're not the laughing stock. You you go from being a disgrace to the middle of the range to all right, so yeah. you've got the belief you're a decent team. All right, yeah. Well, just mentioning that now, I, I want to go now to round 10 because this turns out to be a, a very important match in the Rooster season because they go on a, a long winning streak. East go undefeated uh, in 
well, 10 of their next 11 matches. Yes. And it starts in round 10 against uh, South Sydney. Now, South, South are second on the table at this point of the season. They're second and East are down in seventh uh, spot. Uh, so, Perry, round 10 versus South Sydney at the Sydney Sports Ground in front of 17,363 people. What happens in this match? Well, South Sydney, you could, I guess you could say they're the upstarts. Mm. They stood up to the might of St George. They lost a couple of grand finals, but they were they were the team on the rise. Mm-hmm. That win gave the rest of the program under Jack Gibson the validation, validation that they're up to this level. What they were doing was um, on their wrong task. The task was, you know, contain the opposition team, stop them scoring tries, give yourself a chance to win. The Roosters that year struggled to score points in many games, but they won their game through defence. And all reports of that game um, in the um, the Sydney Morning Herald was mm. the Roosters out tackled South Sydney. Mm. All right, all right. And uh, Sid Walsh, who you mentioned there earlier on, he was named Player of the Match after that uh, after that fixture. Okay, Perry, I just want to divert for a moment because after that match. There was a very interesting table appears in the weekly edition of the uh, Rugby League News. And this table looks at the defensive performances of all the clubs at the halfway stage of the competition. Now, Eastern Suburbs, and remember, East are running seventh. East are on top of this table. They've conceded just 15 tries. Uh, St George is second best. They've conceded 16 tries. And but as you said there, at the end of the season, East are by far and away the best defensive team in the competition. There, there's in actual fact, there's quite a margin between East and the second best uh, 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 defensive team. But again, Perry, this this sort of becomes a characteristic of uh, Jack Gibson coach teams. They are very good defensive teams. It, it starts with East, but it goes throughout his uh, career as a coach. Yes, well, like I say, Jack carried through that. 10 points a game, all the way up through to Parramatta when they did their three-peat. You know, Jack was always often heard, if we can stop the, stop the team scoring 10 points, odds are we're going to win the game. All right, OK, OK. All right, let's go to round 12 then. Now, round 12, they're playing Canterbury, uh, Canterbury Banks down. And at this stage of the season, Canterbury are now on top of the table. Uh, but this match is also uh, significant because it's the match of the day at the Sydney Cricket Ground. Now, uh, I'll quickly explain for our younger listeners there. Uh, at this stage in the well history of rugby league, the match of the round is always played on a Saturday afternoon at the Sydney Cricket Ground. And this is important for Eastern Suburbs because, well, they've not played at the Sydney Cricket Ground since 1962. Uh, so, Perry, what happens in this match against Canterbury, round uh, 12? Well, I guess that was, you could say it was the the um, the birth the birth of the sleeping giant. Mm-hmm. They were on the big stage against the Canterbury team, which was led by Kevin Ryan, who went across from St George. Mm-hmm. So they had a sprinkle of internationals across the field. And again, like that game against South Sydney a few weeks earlier, they again they lifted themselves, out tackled the Bulldogs, who were a much bigger, mm-hmm. uh, a more skillful team. Most people said, but again the the Bulldogs didn't adapt as quickly as um, the Roosters did to this um, limited tackle. The Roosters in that game kicked and chased all day mm-hmm. and turned the big forwards around. Again, the match report from Alan Clarkson said it was like watching. Um, Seagulls chasing a hot chip at the beach. <laughs> yes. He said they just swarmed in and um, they just trapped the, um, the back three from the doggies and they couldn't make no ground on them. Well, yes, because uh, from the uh, from the descriptions of the match, well, Tom Goodman, who was writing in the uh, uh, Sun Herald there, noted that, well, Canterbury won the second half scrums by 2-1 to one, and he said that 30 of the last 40 minutes were played in Eastern Suburbs half. And he went on to conclude, he says here, I quote, East gave a thrilling and sustained display of determined low tackling. He um, 
highlighted the uh, performance of uh, Lewis Newman, who we spoke before. Uh, he seemed to think that uh, Newman might have been lucky to uh, stay on the field. He was cautioned three times. He had a personal battle with uh, Merv Hicks. Merv Hicks was uh, an Englishman who played for Canterbury at this stage. And um, Bruce Stewart, again, who you, Alapa Stewart, who you mentioned before, he was the man of the match. And it was interesting to note, he came to East from South on a $200 transfer fee. So things have definitely uh, changed. Uh, all right. Um, now, as I said earlier, East were on a long winning streak. Uh, they only lost one match in 11 games. That loss was actually against Newtown. It was a mud bath at the Sydney Sports Ground, round 14. And uh, New Sound, second row of their Brian Blows, uh, scores a try with just two minutes to go. A try which, uh, well, apparently was set up by Newtown's halfback, Greg Hartley. Uh, yes. <laughs> and Greg Hartley was a Roosters junior. Um, yeah, well, uh, this... So Greg Hartley, again, because Jack Hartley's father was one of the men who formed the Paddington Colts football club. Ah, uh-huh. all right. And Bob Lanigan, uh, Bob Lanigan, uh, Newtown's fullback. There, he kicks a conversion from the sideline, so uh, Newtown win by seven points to five. Okay, that brings us now to round fifteen, Sunday, July the ninth, versus St George. And by now, St George are on top of the table. Uh, I think we should mention uh, that this match is played the day after the third test. Again, the test matches were played on the su- Saturday. And on Sunday, we had the club matches. So this match against St George is played after the third test. Uh, as we said earlier, there is a test series against New Zealand in 1967. Australia wins the test series. Uh, they win all three tests. They won the third test by 13 to 9. But there are a lot of St George players involved in this test match. Uh, Reg Gaznier is, uh, well, he's not only the captain, he's the coach of Australia at this stage. Uh, Graham Langlands is there, Johnny King, Billy Smith, and uh, Johnny Raper. So, Perry, just outline what occurred in the uh, Round 15 case, remembering as well that East haven't beaten St George in a very long time. Yeah, I guess um, you could say that, you know, that St George team had maybe a halfback and a lock forward who were known to have a light and joy drink. Mm-hmm. So maybe they might have been a little bit worse to wear the next day. Might have had a lack, lack of sleep between games. Mm-hmm. But this this was the this was the moment. Um, they were set. The Roosters were set for this game. Um, they knew that to be taken as a serious rugby league team, they had to win this game. Um, quite interesting. The stories around at the time was a lot a lot of money was put on the roosters to win this game. Uh-huh, okay. So, again, you know, the smart money is was such new that the roosters are up for it. I guess with the timing, they got St George at the right time, but um, it doesn't hurt to beat a team that has won 11 premierships straight. No, no they and, win. And um, that was the moment when the roosters program was given endorsement that they were fine. Yeah. They were on their way up. Jack Gibson's tactics were on the way, it was the modern way of rugby league, the new way of playing rugby league. And it was also the changing of the guard a little bit that the St George style was still successful because of the brilliant individuals mm-hmm, yeah. that other teams had to adapt to compete with them, and which they did. Uh, well, uh, they win the match by 15 points to nine, and Frank O'Rourke uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald, he says, and I'm quoting here, East caused the sensation of the rugby league season. East produced a display of organised and courageous defence that has seldom been equaled. Teamwork, great stamina and that superb defence all combined in this victory. Yes. Okay. And as, as we've mentioned previously, they, the Roosters backed that season on defence. Mm. They weren't a big team. Yeah, most forward packs monstered them, but they just tackled low were fit and they backed, they backed themselves every week on their fitness ability and their ability to, to defend four or five consecutive sets of tackles. Yeah, all right. Okay, so despite this great uh, winning streak uh, for East uh, that season, this the season actually comes down to the final round, round 22. Yes. 
it, it had been a very uh, it, it was a very close season you know throughout the season Balmain were on top of the table South were on top Canterbury St George they all led the competition at various stages but for East they had to win their final match against Parramatta to qualify for the semi-finals both Balmain and Manly also had chances to make the semis but Eastern Suburbs prevail a late field goal there again by Kevin Ashley gave East a 15 to 14 victory uh, luck was probably definitely on their side the Parramatta goal kicker there Arch Brown he missed a kick from in front of the post and a Dick Thorne a Dick Thornet field goal uh, attempt there hit the post for Parramatta but after running stone motherless last there in 1966 Eastern Suburbs are semi-finalists in 1967 and Perry that brings us to August the 26th the minor semi-final against Canterbury could you just run us through what takes place on that uh, uh, in this game the the minor semi-final against Canterbury yeah so as our listeners may not know in the old days the minor semi was a knockout semi yes yeah you know, so loser out um, the Bulldogs were uh, a team which had bought well, they had two very good front rowers, international front rowers. Mm-hmm. The Roosters' run of being able to defend, defend, defend took its toll. They were a class below the top two or three teams. Yep. But, and looking at the scoreboard, you know, like you might look at it as only 12, 13 points, but from all reports, the Bulldogs just were too good for the day on the day the roosters tried hard defended well but um they weren't up they weren't able to match the um the bulldogs on the day who ran out comfortable winners it was 13 to 2 but i think it, it seems to me like the first half uh, uh because east had 10 shots at goal in the first half but they only had one success in that uh, 10 shots at goal so alan mckean must have been uh, off radar that day. Uh, yeah, the, the problem that Roosters team, as we've mentioned before, they were like they had the best defensive record by far, but they had teams that Mr. Semis had a better attacking record than them. Mm, yeah. So the Roosters off would back themselves in defence, and against a quality team, if you can't score tries and you can't kick your goals, you can't win, no matter how good you tackle. Yes, just mentioning the attack there, uh, apparently Les Johns, the Canterbury fullback, he had a very big game. And, I mean, the other, I suppose, big turning point for Eastern Suburbs came at half-time when Kevin Juni, uh, well, didn't come out for the second half. He, he, he was injured and didn't come out for the second half, so that would have been a big loss uh, for Eastern Suburbs uh, going into the second half of that match. And uh, again, you t- spoke about the uh, possession there. The scrums favoured Canterbury by twenty-three to nine in this yes. uh, in this fixture. So, uh, um, you know, so they lose the match by thirteen points to two. The revolutions of nineteen seventy sixty-seven would continue. Uh, two le- two weeks later, when. Uh, Canterbury ended the reign of the uh, all-conquering St George Dragons in the preliminary final, but Canterbury couldn't stop the next revolution because on grand final day, the South Sydney revolution was just beginning. Perry, Jack Gibson went on to coach East again in 1968. Again, they make the semi-finals, but he left the club at the end of that season. Why, why did he leave at the end of 68? Well, his contract was up and he sat down with uh, Ron Jones, who was the mm-hmm. chairperson of the Roosters, and Ron Jones offered him two hundred dollars less than what he was on in '67 and '68. Uh, Jack Gibson actually said, "I took you to the semis two years in a row, mm-hmm. and you want me to take a a pay cut." And then, as a result of that, um, right, um, uh, Lewis Newman went on to be captain coach. Lewis in Newman, yes, yes, he came. Oh, sorry, in '69. In '69, so what? Do you, well, what do you think that Eastern Suburbs learned? What did they learn in 1967, mate? Well, I think the first thing was obviously the trip, the trip to America and study the defence. Mm-hmm. I guess off the field they got their act together. You know, rugby league was, um, you know, on a Saturday afternoon at the SCG. You know, you'd see, you'd walk into the ground, people were selling raffle tickets for the injured players fund. Right. You know, it was a took raffle down the local pub for your local club. 
the Roosters built a lease club. They went semi-professional off the field with their staff, mm -hmm. which changed the modern face of rugby league. Uh, Jack Gibson was ahead of everyone else. He went to England and studied how the English teams um, adapted to that game. He went with the modern day light forward who was very mobile. Yeah, if you look at the teams that Jack Gibson had after that, yeah, you know, he had the odd, the odd big front rowers such as a Bob O'Reilly. Yeah. But he went with the mobile back rower. And again, he again he backed his defence. The team that was the fittest, the teams that could tackle all day, didn't need 60% of the ball to win. Right, OK. And I think that was the off the field, the Roosters got their act together. And again, it's hard to imagine asking the coaches, taking them from wooden spoon to semi-finalists in two consecutive years to take a pay cut. But I guess anyone who knows the history of Ron James will know that that's just how he operated. That's the way it was back in 1967. My name's Rob Corral. On behalf of Perry Johnson, this program was produced by Tony Peterson. Until next time, may the force be with you. It's no